talk about everything. But uh, before we get started, uh, Rich, how are you doing? Yeah, good, mate. Thanks. Yeah, good. We're um, we're gearing up for Call of the Wild Festival this weekend, so uh, we're playing on Friday. So um, it's absolutely throwing it down with rain here at the moment. So I'm hoping <laughs> that that cleans up by uh, by Friday. But uh, yeah, all good, mate. Thank you. All good. How are you? I- I'm good. Are you hoping that your music's going to bring the sunshine through the clouds? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Well, any, any, as long as it's not raining, I'll take anything really. But um, hey, we've played in all weathers in the past, and it always goes all right. A few beers, and everything's all right in it. So. Exactly. So, <laughs> uh, Rick, we'll go back to the very beginning for you. So, where were you brought up? So, I'm from Nottingham originally. Right. And were you into music <coughs> from a young age? Were you exposed to music? Yeah. Well, my dad's always been a musician, so he's for all my life been a bass player in various different bands he he does kind of um he's always done the covers circuit so playing 60s 70s 80s kind of pop rock kind of stuff so he was always out gigging so even from i don't know probably the age of about five i was going out with him to to gigs and things so it's always been a part of my life and it was his influence that got me playing the guitar so obviously your dad is playing um bass guitar yeah, it, you know you're obviously used getting used to the just experiencing the gig circuit probably before you even knew what it was all about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. uh, it was very much kind of working men's clubs and pubs and all of that kind of more old school kind of scene. Yeah, which is very different to what we do, but in yeah. in you know basic terms, yeah, out out experiencing gigs and seeing what live music's all about really, and and how people react to that and uh, yeah. the enjoyment that he got from playing so uh, so you're, and all that you're, stuff. So your, your dad's obviously playing cover songs, but what, what dad? What music was your dad into that, that kind of rubbing off on yourself? Yeah, so bands like The Police, he was really into Led Zeppelin, all of that kind of 70s uh, rock stuff. Not, I don't think it's re- nothing as heavy as what we do, really. Zeppelin probably being the heaviest, but Queen, Police, Beatles, Stones, all, oh, that, all that good stuff. You know? All the stuff that he grew up on, but f- for yourself, what age were you when you discovered your own musical taste, like bands for yourself? Um... What age? I don't know really. I guess probably from the age of around 10 you start to form your own opinions on what music you like and stuff like that. When I was sort of, when I was in my early teens, sort of 13, 14, 15, Britpop was kind of the thing that was going on then. So obviously that was a great time to be a a young person getting into music because it was such a booming scene and all the Oasis Blur, Supergrass. Pulp, Call the Shaker, all of those bands were kind of what I was into. And, you know, a lot of that stuff still stands up now in terms of how good the music was. So I think that was just a a lucky time to be kind of growing up, getting into music. And there was obviously a whole scene that was attached to the music as well in terms of fashion and the media and all that kind of stuff that kind of helped form uh, form that. So I think from that perspective, it was lucky because I was just kind of picking up a guitar around that age and starting to learn guitar. And then every, everywhere you looked, there were guitar bands that were doing really well. And uh, guitar music was probably at its peak then, I guess, in terms of certainly there's been, I don't think there's been a time since then where guitar music has been so prominent and so popular. So, yeah, that's kind of what formed my, my musical taste and influences with that kind of um, more classic rock sort of stuff that I picked up from my dad in the background, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I would probably agree with you that being for Britain, anyway, it was definitely the last big musical movement because it wasn't even just music, it was it was everything visual, visual yeah. as well as sound. And uh, it, it, it's true what you're saying. I, mean, you, like, I wasn't into the... Because I, I like the more hard rock, heavy metal stuff, so I, although I was a teenager right through the 90s when Britpop was a big thing, I wasn't too interested in it, but now when I go back and listen to it, some of it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And it still sounds as good today, if not better, than it probably did back then. Exactly, and that's the that's the sign of good music, right, is when it, it has longevity and it stands up over time. A lot of the stuff from, you know, the years that followed, it was very disposable throwaway stuff that you're probably never going to hear again. But that, but that that era, all those bands, I mean, some of those bands are still going, right? Or they've made comebacks at least. Yeah. Um, 
but but a lot of that music is just good good music good songs that um i don't think will ever ever date or age really what was it that drew you to the to the guitar as an instrument uh i think just because that was the sort of the music that i was into it was all guitar based sound and it's just the coolest instrument right it's like it's 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 just cool and um it's it's very versatile in the sense of like if you compare it to like a bass for example if you just sat there playing it on your own it's a much more versatile instrument it's not it's not as big as a bass so like for a young person you can get your hands around it and physically actually play it which is important um and yeah just just like the sound of it you know i was i was never into I started off learning kind of folk mu- folk type music on an, on an acoustic guitar, which was a good way to learn, but it wasn't really never really got me excited. I was very I was almost straight away into get the distortion on, get it plugged in, turn it up, and and start making some some cool noises. And, and that was really what drew me to it and stuck with it. Really, you know, I would never profess to be a, a particularly competent technical player, but it's all about the feel and the sounds and the style that, that excites you and that's what we've kind of stuck with and what I've stuck with and still doing now. Did you start with guitar lessons or did you learn by yourself or did your dad show you some bits and pieces? Yeah, start, we started with lessons. So it was me and two mates from school. We all decided to take it up at the same time and we went to lessons together. So there was the three of us that would go once a week and sit with a, a guitar tutor. And he was teaching us all like, finger picking like folk style acoustic finger picking we were sat there with three like strats plugged in doing like finger picking so say well straight away it wasn't quite the right fit but it was a good way to get the like the fundamentals of playing the guitar down and um yeah just it, it stuck that sort of style of guitar it, you can you can apply it to almost any anything going forward you know if you know how if you know how to do chord transitions you know how to do finger picking you got control over what your left hand's doing and what your right hand's doing you can apply that to anything so it was it was a good way to learn we we did that for maybe like a, i don't know a year or so and then quite quickly realized you know what we kind of we're taking from this as much as we're going to take from it and we can go on our own way from then on and start to apply it to more of the source rock sound that we were really into and then the three of us went off and formed a band after that which we did for a little while and um and as i say carried it with me since then so it was a good it was a good grounding but um yeah it, it wasn't the kind of the thing that got me excited from from the get-go but learning any instrument's hard right you've got to persevere with it and have some patience with it and um having the lessons gave us the I guess the structure and the motivation to to keep going when you know you, you you pick something up, you're excited by it at first, and then after a little while, you start to you know, oh god, right, yeah, this is actually quite hard, and and push yourself to keep going with it. So for that reason, it was a good thing to do. I mean, the good thing with um, the good thing, especially if you were influenced by by Brit pop, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but you know, a lot of their stuff was. <laughs> simpler to learn to play because it yeah, was so much yeah. about melody in the hook that it didn't need to be technically complicated so you could pretty much pick something up um, as a sort of learner and you could yeah. probably get it and, and then progress from there whereas if you were listening to stuff that was a bit more technical you know you'd probably spend a, a longer time sort of learning but maybe not getting anywhere yeah exactly. but, but that's obviously the guitar what about singing? When did you, did you get into singing at the same time, or did that come later on? Singing was a bit later. We formed a we formed a band when we were maybe I don't know fifteen or something, and we were doing exactly like you say, kind of just ripping off the Britpop stuff, you know, chords E, A, G, and D, and you can pretty much play most things, right? So we were so we were bashing bashing all the all those sorts of things out, and it was almost. Through the, through the lack of any any other willing volunteer that I gave the singing a go, to be honest with you, as I right, well, I'll try it. But um, I would never say I was really any good at singing in that style, that kind of more clean, melodic kind of style. Um, it was only a few years later when, in a different band, having taken a break from bands for a little while whilst I was at uni, we put a new band together doing classic rock covers stuff where we were playing Zeppelin, Thin Lizzy, ACDC. That I really, I really found my kind of 
my my natural home in terms of that particular sound and the way that I sing fits much more with that kind of sound and and that's kind of what's uh, what we, what I'm still doing kind of singing in that more rock style that much more intense loud yeah. rock style you know yeah. and um, I guess that's just I don't know some you're just born with it I guess you can either kind of do that do that or not it's not something I've ever worked at or kind of had any kind of sort of training at or anything like that it's just uh, it's just what comes out when I open my mouth you know <laughs> yeah I mean vo- vocals is a difficult one because there is a lot of it that, you know there can be technique there can be this and that but a lot of it is also confidence and it's not something yeah. you, someone sometimes you've either got it or you don't have it mm. You know, and it's as you say, it's whoever sometimes is bravest to step in front of the mic and give it a go. That's it. And then it, it takes time to to figure it out. But see, obviously, when you're on stage now, you're singing and you've got the guitar. Yeah. Is there one that you're more comfortable with doing, or are you quite happy with with the two now? I'm happy. I'm happy with both now. I mean, I think once you take away any um like you say confidence issues of standing up in front of a room of people um and and you just do your your natural thing you know both both aspects of it i'm completely comfortable with the initially the singing is the more nerve-wracking part right standing in front of people and opening your mouth and people you know depending on how much you know about music how much live music you you're used to watching some people only can really identify with the vocal aspects of it and they're not really too bothered about the rest of the the noise that's coming out and they're only listening to the voice other people are just happy absorbing the whole energy of the whole band thing and they're not really focusing on any particular aspect of it and critiquing you in that way but certainly the singing is the thing that i would say is more of a challenge and certainly requires i should say a bit more a bit more confidence to do but now i've been doing it been doing it for so long and because we're playing our own songs these days it's almost like well if if we play it that way on the day that's how the song is you know it's like it because it, it, it's our music so it's like it, it can never be right or wrong in that sense so once you get used to that it just kind of becomes a lot more natural and i wouldn't say we're on autopilot if in in that in it exactly but you know what i mean it's just kind of it's just it just flows it just comes naturally and and we're, yeah. and we're comfortable with what we're doing. So, um, so yeah, I don't think too much about it these days, really. I mean, we've got a massive gig coming up this week, going to be on a big festival stage and stuff, and I probably will think about that a bit more than I normally would in a small club or a pub or whatever, just because it's a different environment and a bigger crowd and a bigger stage and all yeah. that sort of thing. Um, but 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 nerves and things aren't really a problem these days, which is which is quite a nice place to be because you can just enjoy yeah. you can just enjoy it more, you know. Yeah, so you're obviously like, uh, that, that's you kind of like learning your instrument growing up. So when we fast forward, when was when did the band start? So this band first started as just a, a concept back in 2016. Right. So quite a few years back now, but we've had a few different incarnations of the same band up until this point. So we've had a couple of, we've, we've been through two different bass players. Uh, yeah. Now we don't have a bass player at all. We've gone to like a two-piece format. So that was another big change. So, and then we've had COVID, a big pandemic in the middle, where for basically, you know, best part of two years, nothing was happening in, in live music and nothing was happening with the band. So although 2016 feels like a long time ago, when you break it up into those different sections, yeah. it actually just felt quite fat, like a lot of changes happened and a lot of things have happened in that time. So really, in this latest incarnation of the band, we've been doing this for a year, a year and a bit. So it still feels to us like quite a new and fresh thing, even though in theory we've been we've been doing it for a while. How did the how did you come up with the band name? And was there any alternatives that you're willing to share? <laughs> I mean, band names are a nightmare. Like uh, <laughs> nobody can ever agree. First of all, um, and then almost as soon as you commit to it, you start thinking of other things that you might have preferred to have called yourself or whatever. But but how did it come about? Well, there was three of us at the time, so obviously that kind of speaks for itself. We were playing around with this concept of kings and what kind of... Uh, we just liked the, the idea of kings and the energy that that carried and the meaning behind that. And then kind of three kings, we three kings, it just kind of had a, had a bit of a ring to it. It's something that we get asked a lot about the name because... Obviously, it's a known it's a known phrase. People have connotations in their mind about where that's originated from and all that sort of stuff. And, 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 and people, so people ask us about it a lot. 
which means that I think it does its job in the sense of it being memorable and distinctive and causes piques people's interest. You know, if we were just called, I don't know, the Black Bullets or whatever, you know, you, you're kind of I think more in amongst a crowd of similar, similar yeah. sounding bands and similar similar brands and all that kind of thing. So we want something distinctive. Something that, like I say, would cause a, cause people to think a little bit, and also reflected what the band is, you know. And, and it has since come on to cause us a bit of a headache when we went from a three piece to down to a two piece, and that was a little bit of a, a, a head scratcher. But we we found an ingenious solution to that. It's a wee bit like, have you ever seen that movie Airheads? Yes. Yeah. And they're called the Lone the Lone Rangers, but, but they're not lone. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So my advice would be to anybody thinking of naming a band, don't tie yourself to anything that's numerical or anything that kind of is going to put you in a box for the future. So uh, in hindsight, maybe that wasn't the smartest move, but it's it, but it's kind of a, a bit of a a funny novelty factor now, the fact that we've got uh, two people in a band that's called We Three Kings. Yeah, and how did um, how did you meet up with Pete and start? Did you know Pete <laughs> or how did that come about? So I met Pete through work. We both work at the same company and still do to this day, actually. And um, when I first joined, I was looking to put a band together. And I knew that the, and I knew just from kind of chatting to him in, in and around the office and things that he'd, he had just broken up from a, re- a different band. Right, okay. And he was playing drums. And I was like, look, if you ever fancy putting something together, you know, I've got these, these ideas of what I would like the band to be and the sort of sound that we'd like to explore. And originally, I think he was just... He was so recently broken up from his other band that he was a bit, um, he, he was not exactly full of beans about the idea of being in any band, but then I kind of pestered him a little bit and he, and he soon came around to it. And that was back in, God, it was been about 2008. This was a different band. So uh, we, me and Pete have been, in, we've been playing in bands for like 15 years now or something like that. So um, yeah, we're still, we're still going and still, still speaking to each other and good mates after all that time, which yeah. is an achievement in itself. So, so how do you go about songwriting? So, for example, do you come up with the songs and then you take it to Pete and work on it from there, or do you just get into a room and, and jam it out? How, how does it come about? All, all of the above, really. So sometimes uh, it might just form from a jam where we're literally just improvising in the rehearsal room and we might come up with a bit of a riff or something or a bit of a melody that we're like, oh, yeah, we can use that and try and build on that and then over time develop that. Pete's got this habit of, in random moments, coming up with things and recording them into his phone, like little, we, we call them hiffs, right? So it's like a humming riff, a hiff. And he's just like, so we'll come in and go, I've got this thing, and it'll just be like Rolf Harris kind of style going, and we're like, right, okay, I'm not really sure what we can do with that, but we'll try it. And other times it might be like a guitar part that I've come up with that I'll just kind of bring and we'll just say, oh yeah, I've got this, what do you think, what can we do with that? And oftentimes it's a combination of all those things. So we might have part of an idea over here and another idea over there, and we might meld them together and come up with, it, yeah. come up with songs. So there is no binary formula for, for songwriting. It's a very equitable process. Like we, we both put equal amounts of energy and inspiration in, into the songs. And, um, you know, it's, it's gone really well. Like up until this point, we've got a, a, a catalog of, of songs that, that we're really proud of. And, at the moment, I think we're writing some of the best stuff we've ever written, and we've we've already put two singles out this year. We've got one that's already in the can, and we've got an EP that we're planning to bring out towards the end of the year with some more stuff on it that we're really uh, proud of. So it's going well at the moment. We're, we're full of ideas, and, it, and it's nice to just keep that kind of momentum going with new material and keep things moving and feeling fresh. And uh, how do you go about recording? So do you have a preferred method to use record live in the studio do you do you track the drums first and then overdub everything on top what, what's your preferred way of recording yeah i mean we've tried different we've tried different methods over the years we, we we've done it where we've broken everything down and done every instrument separately to like a click track and pieced it all yeah. together which is fine but takes a lot longer and i think the outputs tend to have you can tell the difference between that and, and like playing live, for example. You can't, it's, it's more difficult to capture the energy. So most recently what we've done is played live in a room, all mic'd up and everything, and used that drum track as the basis of the song and then just added any guitar parts and vocals and stuff onto the top of that as required. Um, but the fundamental kind of root of the song is a live 
session, yeah. which I think the type of band we are is important that we try and carry that energy and vibe over onto the records that you, you would get when you come and see us live and for it not to be too clinical in terms of the, the recording and um, a little bit rough around the edges, deliberately so, so that you've got that feel and that, that sort of energy about, about what the band is. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how we're doing it at the moment. That seems to be working quite well um, and we'll probably stick with that method, I think, now. Steve, if you had to pick one, which do you prefer? Do you prefer writing and recording or do you prefer performing? Oh, I mean, I think as a band, live performances are really at the heart of what you're all about. You know, I think if you take that away, we'd find it difficult to be able to tell you what the purpose of the band is, really, if you, t- if you were to take away the, the, live, the live aspect of it. Um, because that's when you get the buzz, the real buzz of, you know, being on stage, you get all the instant feedback from audiences, you get um, just the kind of the enjoyment factor of it, really. I mean, going into the studio and recording and writing and that, it's great because you've got, it's a creative process, you're producing something that didn't exist before, you'll, you'll have that for the rest of your life to be able to look back on and say, do you know what, I, that's, that was an achievement and that, that's something that we can we can show our grandkids and all, and all the rest of it. But um yeah, I think live is live is what it's all about, and that's what we get, that's where we get the buzz, and that's what we we do it for, really. To be honest, what about the the artwork side of things? Is that is that still important nowadays? Because you would have probably been similar to myself growing up. That back when music shops existed, you would go in, you would flick through the CDs, you know, you would maybe pick one out simply based on how it looked, the album yeah. cover. And nowadays, music streamed, it's downloaded. There's a, probably a whole generation of people that, that don't really associate artwork with no. music. Um, but for someone like myself, um, I still find it very important. What, what about yourself? How do you? What's your feelings on artwork? It's important to me. Yeah, I don't think it's important though anymore. Like you've just, like exactly like you've just articulated. Like if I'm putting a song out, I want it to have decent artwork and I want it to reflect the band and the song and the, type and the style of music and all that kind of stuff. So you can spend, and I have spent ages agonising over, like tweaking tweaking things forever and all the rest of it, but then it goes on Spotify and it's a tiny little thumbnail like that big. Nobody really pays any attention to what it is. So I think it's important to have something. I think it's important that each release has a, an identity attached to it and, and you, you can distinguish one song to the next. Yeah. Do, do I think it drives people's listening behaviours in the same way? No, I don't. Not anymore, unfortunately. Um, and you know, we don't really have any physical music. You know, we don't we don't produce vinyl. Not not the moment, anyway. So, in the in the absence of that, it's just something to attach to a digital product that I don't think people really, unfortunately, pay too much attention to anymore. At least not not as many people as as used to. Um, but it's all part of the creative process for me. Like, if you're going to put a release out, it's not just about the music. It's about the video. It's about the artwork. It's about the 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 energy and the, the style in which you're packaging it up and taking and presenting it to people. Photography, yes. photography of the band that goes alongside that's important because people need to be able to look at you and, and be able to connect that to the sound that you make in and think, right, okay, they sound like a heavy rock band. They look like a heavy rock band. You know that kind of all needs to needs to join up. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's an interesting question. I do definitely think that that has changed dramatically over the years. It's funny what you're saying there because uh, I've got a friend um, who was on one of the previous episodes and, and he'd released, he'd spent a long time recording an album. He's even a bit older than myself, so he, he really does come from the generation of, you know, artwork is important or it's certainly important to him. Spent a lot of time going through all this and although it was going to get it on Spotify on iTunes, it was going to get streamed, it was going to be getting downloaded, he still wanted physical copies. Mm. You know, it's something cool just to hold in your hand and say, yeah. I like this. So he went and got all these CDs made and then he realised he didn't have a CD player. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. I think the only one I've got is in my car and I, and I never use yeah. it. So, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's an economic question, right? It's like, are you going to? Is it is it in your interest financially to produce vinyl and CDs these days? You know, and it's not that easy to go out and do short, or it's not that economical to go out and do short runs of stuff. So you, you can't really go out and just do ten albums on vinyl and see if you sell any. You've got to go out and order two hundred 
And then you're like, oh, bloody hell, I'm stuck with 200 bloody records that have cost me an X amount, I mean, 100 pounds, and then, you, and then you've got to work really hard to shift it. And you no, start thinking, well, hang on a minute, I'm, I'm, am, I a, am I a shopkeeper or am I a musician, you know, which is, which is it? Because nowadays you would maybe be <laughs> releasing the music online and spending the money on T-shirts or something because exactly. that, that sounds selling. Exactly, yeah, and we do do T-shirts and we sell quite a lot of T-shirts and um, we're looking at a few other bits and pieces of merch that, that people are going to want to uh, are going to want to get. So um, we do we do have products that physical products that people are, are able to buy. We have our music up on Bandcamp, which people can pay to download, and some people choose to do that because they would rather pay the artist for the for the money rather than just streaming it for free and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, be, most musicians will tell you it's not a profitable enterprise being in a band, right? And, and, and so as long as you accept that and you're not too hung up on that, then it's kind of, you just pick and choose your battles in terms of what you're, what you're going to try and sell and, and how much the finances dictate what you do. Uh, so we're obviously still within the first half of 2024. So what is the plans for the remainder of the year? So busy summer, we've got a few festivals coming up. So we're going to be playing at Call of the Wild Festival this coming weekend, which we're excited about. That's going to be, uh, we played there last year, really enjoyed it. We were on the kind of, I guess, the new band stage, you would call it. And this year we've been bumped up onto the main stage. So that's going to be an exciting thing for us. Then we've got Love Rocks Festival down in, all the way down in Bournemouth that we're going to be doing. I think that's in end of July um, or maybe it's end of June, end of June. And then we're going to be playing at Five Alt Festival in Manchester, which is uh, one that we're really looking forward to because that's that's close to home for us. That's in August. Like I say, we've got more new music that we're going to be bringing out. We've got uh, at least one more single release, and then we're going to we're planning to do an EP in the autumn time. And every time we do a release cycle, there's quite a lot that goes into that in terms of all the promo and all the videos and all that kind of stuff that we've got to do. Um, so in and around real life, that's quite a lot to be uh, to be getting on with, you know. And we've always got a steady cadence of gigs in and around the northwest area where we live. So, um, so yeah, I'm sure there'll be a few of those that come along as well. And then, yeah, one or two other things that we're working on. We're going up to Newcastle towards the end of the year. I think it's October time, which will be our first time playing up there. So we're excited about that. So trying to spread our wings a little bit and, and, and get a bit further afield uh, with the gigging, which is exciting. So... Yeah, busy, busy old time, but it's all going really well, and we seem to have really good momentum behind the band. We're getting lots of really positive feedback, and, and everybody's kind of excited about the things that we're up to at the moment. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're happy with how it's going and enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, you've got your band's website. You're on social media, so anybody wanting to follow you uh, or find out dates, it's, it's all advertised. You okay. can check that out. But, yeah. uh, Rich, before we go, we've been quite serious up to this point, so yeah. I'll ask fun questions before we end this all right mate yeah right so imagine that you could go back in time imagine you could go anywhere in the world what's the one concert or gig that you wish that you could have attended that you could have been in the crowd to witness i'd say probably the first live aid wembley you know with uh, the famous queen set with freddie yeah. mercury and all that sort of stuff i think that's just such an iconic moment in time back when Rock music was really at its absolute peak. Um, that's definitely one. I mean, the, the band. I mean, the bands that I'd, you'd love to go back and see that are, it's not possible these days. One would be Led Zeppelin yeah. uh, for me. I've been lucky to see the Rolling Stones a couple of times, so that only really leaves the Beatles that you'd like to go back and see as well, I guess, in terms of ticking off the uh, ticking off all the big ones. But yeah, I think if I had to pick one concert, then that Live Aid one would look, it looked like a pretty good one, didn't it? I think I would maybe add into that maybe some Creedence Clearwater Revival, maybe The Doors and maybe The Who. Oh, yeah, I've seen The Who. Yeah, I've seen The Who, but uh, obviously didn't see The Doors, but that would have been good. The Doors at the Whiskey A Go-Go or something uh, back in the day would have been good, wouldn't it? Somebody had also said maybe Oasis the, the night they went to King Tut's in Glasgow. Oh, yeah, well, I think uh, you might have been the only person there if you went to that one by the sound of it. Yeah, yeah, that would have been an iconic one to have been at, for sure. So for yourself, <coughs> imagine you got the choice, you, you, you could, um, dead or alive, you could lock yourself in the studio and write a few songs with any musician out there. Who, who's a, a musician you, that you just think would be cool to collaborate with? Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix, all day. Yeah. Just completely unique, insane genius on the guitar. Uh, and I just think, yeah, you'd have to... You'd, 
you'd never be able to keep up with him, but it'd be some experience watching him uh, watching him put a few of those licks out, and um, that'd be that'd be something to to see, I think. And uh, as you know, there is millions and millions of great songs that have been recorded across the years. What's a couple of songs that you wish that you could have been sat in the recording studio to witness it being recorded? Uh, well, it's Queen again, but Bohemian Rhapsody, right? I mean, what? How? How does somebody even think <laughs> of coming up with a song like that? I mean, where do you even start? To, like, oh, I've got an idea, lads. It's just like you know, men, men, totally mental. So that. Um, I mean, I watched that um, that Beatles documentary that was on where you could see Paul McCartney writing songs like Get Back just like off the cuff, sitting there just churning them all out and that you just like, wow. as, if, as if they were just throwaway things that have turned out to be some of the most iconic, famous songs of all time. Yeah. So I'd like to have seen that. Um, what else? You know, I like, I like other kind of songs like, you know that song Wichita Line Man? Who done that? Uh, oh, I forget the artist now, but you know, there's just some, and, and I guess some of the stuff that maybe Elvis would, would have done back in the day, which at its, at its core are quite simple yeah. songs, like quite old fashioned kind of songs, but have just stood up to be absolutely iconic, timeless classics. So I think to be in a room when somebody writes something like that, that ends up just being a song that every person on the planet knows, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, that's the power of music, right? And, and just a simple idea can, can travel so far and have so, so much longevity. It's mad, really. Some of those older bands, it would have been pretty cool because back then they, they probably had to play it live in the studio. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, onto tape, all in one take. Yeah, yeah. it would, would have been cool. I mean, obviously, we hearing raps, they might not have even been that interested in watching it get recorded because it was no. so... He sees that it didn't make sense till you heard the final mix of it. Exactly. I don't think even the rest of the band really knew what was going on. I'm just one guy just had the vision for it. And uh, there's never been anything else like that, has there? That's the, or probably never will be. So, uh, yeah, I would say if I had to pick one, that would be the one because it's just a completely unique and iconic piece of music. And the last question for you, Rich. So, Mount Rushmore, who is the four bands or musicians for yourself? Our perfection. Uh, Zeppelin. Yep. The Stones. Uh, ACDC. Oh, okay. And We Three Kings. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be modest or anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's great. Rich, thank you so much for coming on. It was, it was uh, good speaking to you. You too, mate. And uh, I do wish you all the success yourself and Pete uh, down the line with the songs and the festivals and the gigs and hopefully it just continues to grow and grow for you. Thank you, mate. Well, thanks a lot for the chat and thanks for your support and uh, let's stay in touch. Yeah, definitely. Uh, anybody wanting to check out dates for yourself, get yourself onto your social media, get yourself to the website. You've got all the information there and they can keep updated with it. As it, as it goes along the year. That's it. That's it, mate. Just keep on top of that. We keep everything updated and um, just look for the skull with a crown on it. That's us. That's it. Okay. <laughs> nice one, Ian. Thanks a lot, mate. Yeah.